We mentioned early on the idea that genotype produces phenotype, and it's connected to an idea that's called genetic determinism, which is a familiar idea. It may not be true, but it's, it seems to be taught in a lot of textbooks. The idea that we are what our genes make us, that all organisms carry a blueprint in their DNA, and it's that blueprint that makes them what they are. And of course, there is this understanding that there's both nature and nurture, and of course, it's true that the way we're brought up or the environment does affect how we develop as individuals. But the idea of genetic determinism is that DNA really owns the nature part. Nurture is important, but DNA is the whole story in terms of nature. We are what our genes make us, and of course, our environment helps shape us as well. Well, that idea may not be true, but it's become very cemented in the way we think about genetics and biology. So if you're a student of biology, if you're studying biology at any level, you're going to encounter this idea that our genes determine what we are. I want to talk a little bit about an evolutionary corollary to that idea that genes make us what, our, what we are. It, that idea fits nicely with neo-Darwinism because you remember Darwin's theory was about natural selection acting on populations, and he just assumed that variation was something that happened. He didn't in 1859 know anything about DNA or about genes. But with a modern synthesis in the 20th century, a modern view of genetics where DNA encodes proteins and proteins have their functions and their effects in cells, that got married up with Darwin's ideas about natural selection and fitness in populations, and you have a new theory that seems to fit well with this idea of genetic determinism. Why do I say that it fits well? Well, if you want to presuppose, if you want to suppose that all of life descended from some early original life form, some simple bacterium, then you're claiming that the process of mutation and selection was able to convert that early bacterial form of life into all modern forms of life, as diverse as oak trees and blue whales and mushrooms. Every form of modern life would have come from that early uh, simple bacterium, and it would have happened through a process of mutation, accidental mutation, and natural selection acting on the variants that come from mutation. Well, Genetic determinism fits with that because it says all you have to do is change the DNA to change the organism. So the notion that you can go anywhere in this whole, in the whole space of life possibilities simply by changing DNA fits very well with evolutionary theory because DNA is the only thing that gets modified by mutation. And if you can do anything by moving around in a space of possibilities with this, this, the correct or appropriate sequence of mutations, then all you have to do is have natural selection select for the various uh, forms that are most fit to different environments or different contexts, and voila, you get all the life that we see around us. So the two ideas, Darwin's idea and the modern version of Darwin's idea and genetic determinism, fit very well together. What I want to say and what I, what I want you to put a critical lens on is the idea that this is true. Because if you actually look at experimental results, there's no reason to think that one can modify fundamentally the form of life by changing DNA. Mutations definitely have effects, and there are some organisms that have been studied so exhaustively, we really know all the effects that mutations have. The poor fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, is one of these that's been studied for many, many, many years in laboratories, and mutations have been cataloged ad infinitum, and they do all kinds of horrible things to these fruit flies. Many of them do nothing. Some of them kill the fruit fly, and some of them deform the fruit fly. You can get fruit flies that have no wings or that have legs coming out of their head instead of antenna, all kinds of things that aren't normal, none of them turn the fruit fly into something else. It's a gross mutant fruit fly, it's a dead fruit fly, or it's a normal fruit fly. There are no contrary examples. There are no examples where you can convert one life form into another by changing the DNA. That alone, if we're going to be scientists and we're going to be skeptical of our own ideas, ought to make us step back and be skeptical of the idea that we are what our genes make us, Ge that genetic determinism is, de determinism is true, and that the evolutionary corollary that you can take anything to anything else by changing the DNA is true. Let me give you another reason, a very strong reason to be skeptical of this idea. If you look at the supposed transition from simple bacterial life to modern life, a key step early on in that process is going to be the transition from what's called pro prokaryotic life, simple bacterial life, to eukaryotic life. So all complex life has a cell type that's called eukaryotic cell type, 
where the DNA is packaged in a nucleus, the cells are larger, you have all kinds of organelles, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, you have the endoplasmic reticulum. All of these structures that don't exist at all in the bacterial world, they exist everywhere else. Complex life has these structures. Fundamentally different way of doing cellular life separates the bacterial world from the, from the uh, eukaryotic world. So the question is, how did you get from that simpler world to the more complex world? Um, how do you get these new structures within the cell that don't exist in bacterial life? It doesn't seem plausible at all that you could do it simply by mutating a bacterial cell because mutating the DNA is not going to form some structure within the cell. I don't think anyone believes that that's how it happens. There are theories that, that have been put forward, and one is called the endosymbiotic theory uh, for transitioning in evolution from simple bacterial life to eukaryotic life. And perhaps the most plausible account of this, and this was... Uh, this has been advanced since the early 20th century, and then it was um, additional uh, evidence for it was given by Lynn Margulis in the late 1960s. People noticed, and Lynn argued this quite uh, convincingly, that there's a uh, similarity between mitochondria, which are the powerhouses in eukaryotic cells. So all of our cells have mitochondria. They produce ATP by oxidizing chemicals. Well, if you look at Bacteria, they also produce ATP by oxidizing chemicals. The mitochondria have a little wall around them and a membrane, and they pump protons. Bacteria have a wall around them and a membrane, and they pump protons, and those protons are used for ATP uh, biosynthesis. The size of the mitochondria inside a eukaryotic cell are similar to the size of, of some small bacteria. So there's connections that make one think, could it be possible that a bacterial cell, one small bacterial cell, got enveloped by a larger bacterial cell, and that became a mitochondrion. It's, it's somewhat suggestive. It doesn't work, though, if you look at the other organelles. There's no way to account for the endoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum. There's no way to account for the Golgi apparatus. Furthermore, I don't think there's a feasible demonstration even for the mitochondria. No one has shown that one cell can swallow another and then let it take up residence and become a powerhouse inside the bigger cell. But here's the thing to realize. Even if that endosymbiotic theory is correct as far as the mitochondria goes, it is not a simple Darwinian process because it was not a mutating of DNA in the bacterium that produced the mitochondria. Even if this is true, and I'm not granting it, it is, but if it were true, this is a vast radical departure from the standard Darwinian model. It's something that happened that was not a change to DNA. It was not a mutation to DNA. It was some other event where one cell swallowed another and that smaller cell took up residence within it. That's not a mutation. That's not standard uh, Darwinian evolution. So the point is this model that you can simply get from A to B anywhere within the whole space of possible life forms by changing DNA is simply not true. And the endosymbiotic theory, if it's correct, is proof that it's not true. But I think we have other reasons as well to be very skeptical of that idea.